Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, first of all, um, I'm not sure how many of you are here under the pretense that Jado Rinpoche was going to be teaching on the same link this evening. Um, we did send out uh, an email on Sunday informing everyone that that teaching was postponed. We are blessed and lucky enough that Venerable Yonten is going to be teaching uh, in its place, uh, in that teaching's place this evening, an introduction to recognizing my mother. And she actually has extensive um, experience with teaching this particular subject. And so it's very supportive uh, in preparation for us receiving uh, these, this oral transmission from Jada Rinpoche. And of course that uh, reschedule as, as far as the time goes will be sent out as soon as possible. In regards to um, Venerable Lozong Yunten, we're so blessed to have her, her here at Land of Medicine Buddha. Um, she's actually an American born Buddhist nun in the Tibetan tradition. Um, she was in, ordained in 2003, for those of you who are not familiar with her. Um, she's had extensive praise from everybody I personally know who has received teachings from her. Um, she's been practicing since 1994 and she moved to Chenrezig Institute in Australia and studied intensively under Kenzer Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering. Uh, he's a Larapa Geshe from Sarah J Monastery and former abbot of Yume Tantric College. Uh, she studied from 2002 to 2009, completing their Buddhist studies program. And then she then studied Taiwan, as well as Australia and New Zealand, um, becoming an in-depth registered teacher for FPMT, which is a foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition in 2012. So we're very blessed to have her uh, as a teacher here at Land of Medicine Buddha. She's newly arrived just this month, and we're um, very thankful and, uh, and in deep gratitude for her offering these teachings this evening. So. With that, I hand it over to you, Venerable Yonten. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, uh, Land of Medicine Buddha folks. It's uh, um, not what you expected, surprise. Um, so I hope that uh, it's useful to kind of have more of a peer discussion about this text. I'll, I'll share what I know and um, hopefully it'll be a process where we can get kind of all of the miscellaneous clarity and questions under control before we have an amazing teacher like Jado Rinpoche, so that when we have Jado Rinpoche, we can go straight for the really deepest of deep questions and really make the best use of when Rinpoche comes to teach us. So, um, so I really invite you guys to see this as a collaborative peer-led process. Um, I'll do a bit of PowerPoint, um, just context and history of this beautiful poetic text, which I'm really, really fond of. It's a beautiful text. Um, and uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions, but even if as I'm talking, you wanted to quick ask something to clarify, it's okay to just unmute yourself and chime right in. Um, I'll also lead some guided meditation tonight on this subject, um, probably just because it's nice to do guided meditation together um, on emptiness. It doesn't come up as often, so we'll do a bit of that tonight as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start with our motivation. And just take a minute and uh, make sure that you're in a comfortable position that you're going to be able to sustain for the session. And we'll start with refuge in Bodhicitta. Sangye chudon sogi chunam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chen yan gi pe sonam ki drola pen chia sangye drupa sho sangye chudon sogi chunam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chen yan gi pe sonam gi Rola pen jie sangge drupa sho Sangge chudom so gi chunam la Jan chu padu dani gap su chi Dagi chen yan gi pe sonam gi Rola pen jie sangge drupa sho 
all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharma datu by nature have not realized it thus i shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness i shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering i shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering and i shall set in equanimity the cause of well-being free from attachment aversion and partiality okay so when we talk about recognizing my mother um, the experiential song of the view by tangi rope dorje usually the first association we have with mother in buddhism is the sevenfold cause and effect instruction for developing bodhicitta which is starting with equanimity as a foundation then recognizing all sentient beings as having been your mother right that's kind of like the connotation we have with the mother in tibetan buddhism is i'm trying to see all sentient beings as my mother wanting to repay their kindness etc cetera, etc cetera, you know the whole list and in this context it's a completely different analogy here the mother is emptiness. The experiential song of the view is the view of dependent origination, which is then the father. So when we talk about mother as emptiness, it's really important that we think a little bit about what does that convey? And in this context, we're really talking about a space of possibility, womb-like, if you will, the place of potential. If that makes sense. And so recognizing my mother is really an invitation to recognize the lack of inherently existent self. Yes, what was I really born from? Yeah, I was born from a real fleshy mother, you know, and that was very nice of her. However, what we were really born from was that space of infinite possibility that we could call more technically the emptiness of inherent existence. So how to recognize that? First, we have to understand what it is. We also have to understand what it isn't. And what it isn't is a much more confronting conversation, but also really rich and fascinating. So recognizing my mother, just the title is quite a provocative statement. What is the mother? What is recognition? What is my? All of those pieces. So um, I thought I'd just give you a really brief snapshot of the author of this text, and then we'd kind of go through the main themes that this text explores, so that the analogies and the metaphors and all of the beautiful poetry kind of links us to the meaning and links us to practice, rather than making us confused and distracted. We know what's being said when we go through this kind of poetry. So it's very similar to a traditional lojong thought transformation text that a lot of us have studied it very much is that radical reframing of our experience but in this context it's very much just about the method it's about the wisdom side of the path yeah whereas mostly lojong thought transformation is exploring different ways to work with method and conventional truth this one is looking a lot more at ultimate truth and kind of going that direction with it so it's unique in a lot of ways all right so we've got Change Rope dorje 1717 to 1786 roughly speaking um, for those of you that like to hear about um, buddhist scholar and buddhist bodhisattva mm -hmm kind of history and life stories, there's a beautiful website called the Treasury of Lives. And I really recommend you look at that website sometime. It's got a lot of information. So he was the reincarnation of the great Sakya tradition scholar and statesman, Pakpa Lodre Geltsin. So he was not just a scholar, not just a practitioner, but also a statesman and understood politics. He understood everyday life, everyday challenges, and he had kind of one foot in the world, one foot on his cushion and very well understood both sides. So he was an interesting figure for us to be looking at um, a text from. He was in a really strong advisory relationship with the Chinese emperor of the time a very close advisor, and he also had deep connections with the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama of that era. 
So this really interesting combination of being a secular advisor as well as a spiritual advisor. And then not only that, he was a translator, which I think is so important to realize that a translator who is only a scholar is going to make a certain kind of mistake in their approach. But a translator who's a scholar and a practitioner is like a gift, is one of the most precious things we could have as a scholar, practitioner, translator. And that's what he was. So he was fluent in Chinese and Manchurian and Mongolian and Tibetan, and many of his translation works are still used today. So this is a really amazing individual that we're talking about. And um, in knowing that, it kind of conveys that this text is reliable, not just from an academic perspective, but from a real deep practice perspective. So my own relationship with the text and what I'm drawing from is from mainly Geshe Lozam Jamyang, who talk this text once a week for probably six months at Chen Rezig Institute in 2006. That was my first relationship with this text and where I'm drawing a lot of the explanation of today from. Um, also from Yangzi Rinpoche from Matripa College in Portland. Um, he teaches on this text pretty regularly within his master's program. And um, I've received classes from him on this as well. And then of course, His Holiness very recently has taught this text. And um, it's auspicious for us because it was requested by our organization from Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Those, so there's a really strong karmic connection with His Holiness's commentary on this text because of that relationship with Lama Zopa Rinpoche and the organization. So if you feel up to it, your homework, should you choose to accept it, would be to look on His Holiness's YouTube channel Dalai Lama archive and have a look at his commentary on this text because it's just beautiful and pithy, but I'll reference that as well in these classes. Okay, verse one, let's jump in. You who reveals bear, the wonder of profound dependent arising nature. Oh my guru, your kindness is boundless indeed. Kindly reside in my heart, as I utter these spontaneous words from the thoughts flickering through my mind. So we're starting with the guru. Yeah, very familiar, starting with the guru and really inviting the guru to take his seat back at our heart center and to help inspire us. So whenever we're starting with, I pay homage to the guru or you know, the guru is the source of all kindness, we're remembering again and again that this is an invitation to collaboration for a meeting of minds, that it can't be passive or else it won't work. We could have Buddha Shakyamuni in front of us explaining perfectly, and we wouldn't hear it if we weren't listening for wisdom to resonate. And it would only work if our wisdom was listening for wisdom. So we're really thinking the guru is so kind, not because he gives us stuffed animals and presents and snacks and is sweet to us, but the guru is kind because he teaches us in such a way that our own wisdom wakes up and then can develop. And what is the kindest thing the guru can do? To teach you how to get yourself out of this mess. You know, the kindest thing the guru can do is not to validate your ego and tell you you're a good girl or a good boy, right? <laughs> It's not to look at you in class and say, what an amazing meditator you are and flood you with validation. You know, the kindest thing the guru can do is just teach and teach and teach. And that is what they do. And so you ask yourself, what's the way to repay the kindness of the guru? Do they want presents? If that's the best you can do, yes. <laughs> but if you can actually practice, if you can actually study, that is the best way to repay the kindness of the teacher. Right. So this is something we know, right? These, you know, you folks are not new students, you know this, but I think it's really important for us to just reconnect with the kindness of the guru is through teachings. Repaying the kindness of the guru is to actually hear it and practice it and take it so personally that this is personal medicine prescribed specifically for me as an individual to get myself out of samsara. Yeah. 
Are there any questions so far about the teacher, Changi Rope Dorje, or about that first verse? I don't want to run too fast if you're already having some questions arise or some curiosities. So far, so good. Yeah, that. sure, Gompa person. Uh, other, you know, so in this is kitchen teachers, um, and frequently, and, and so it's really great. So I recommend that. Mm. Um, yep, did you guys hear that okay from the Gompa? She was just um, reaffirming that Dalai Lama archive, that YouTube teaching of His Holiness on this text was really excellent. So we've got a <laughs> stamp of approval from the group. And it really is fantastic. Um, on the Land of Medicine Buddha website, um, there's a link to just the section where he teaches this text. If you're wanting just a 45 minute session as opposed to a two hour session, um, I edited it down and I put in English subtitles. So if that's useful for folks, that's on the Land of Medicine Buddha website. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely see that. And it was uh, translated really beautifully as well. Okay. So the mother, okay? The mother is an analogy for the emptiness of inherent existence, which is a non-affirming negation. It's a mere absence. It's not implying anything in its place, but it's the reason why change is possible, right? It's the reason why we have Buddha nature is our mind is empty of inherent existence. And so when we hear this word emptiness, we should really feel potential, potentiality. And that's why this womb-like analogy is used, is that there might not be a baby in the womb yet, but it's kind of a living potentiality. And the quality that all phenomena has and is their ultimate truth is emptiness. Yeah, what is ultimate truth? Emptiness of inherent existence. What is relative truth? everything else which is deceptive do they live in different places of course not but the actual final mode of abidance of all phenomena is their emptiness and so kind of keep coming back to that again and again is the way in which we prevent ourselves from getting stuck in fundamentalist ideas about this is only this way or can only happen this way or is in some way spontaneously arisen out of nowhere or is in some way self-created, nothing exists that way. Everything is a dependent arising and that's why it's empty. So verse two then says, this lunatic child who lost his old mother long ago is about to realize by chance what he is not recognized. She has been with him all along. So this lunatic child, this is, you know, kind of provocative language. And who is the lunatic child? We are the lunatic child. Yeah. And this being an analogy for ourselves is not putting us down. It's recognizing there is an evolutionary process that we can go through that we haven't yet. Both related to sanity and maturity, both. Yeah, so we just kind of unpack that for a second, that right now, there is a level of insanity, there's a level of childishness or immaturity. And that is a very confronting thing to identify with, but it becomes very empowering when you realize it's not permanent. And it's not a punishment, and it's not a fatal flaw, and it's not an original sin. It's just, right now, we're a little nuts, and we're a little childish. And best to know that. Yeah, best to know that because how is it that we get so emotional about small things? How is it that we take things so personally when we have a little slight or a little criticism? Why is it we're not content all the time, even when things externally are so beautiful? Yeah, the family could be briefly in harmony, the temperature could be perfect, the digestive system could be operating in a functional way, you could have a moment where everything settles into place, and still there's an edge of discontent. You know, this is how we are, isn't it? And recognizing this, then you're really starting to look for healthy parental relationship and healthy, for lack of a better word, spiritual psychotherapist to say, here's the way to wellness, here's the way to maturity. Yeah, 
wellness and maturity are our potential. Nothing about us is stuck in place, but it is if we don't recognize right now where we're at. So because we're under the influence of ignorance and disturbing emotions, this is why we are a little bit of a lunatic. Yeah, because right now things appear as if they are inherently existent. They really seem to be self-existent. When we look at a table, it looks like it is a table and has always been a table and has no choice but tableness. And anyone who disputes it is full of nonsense. And we know that's no problem with tables, but then you meet someone you don't like or someone you're having an issue with. And it seems like inherently from their side, they are bad or they are a troublemaker or they are stuck that way that you now have to deal with. And that feeling of they are stuck that way and now you have to deal with it, that feeling, that seeming is a symptom of this ignorance that we all have. It only takes a few seconds pause for us to kind of wake up our maturity that says, of course, no one is one way always. Of course, everyone exists because of context and conditioning. Of course, our own response is a conditioned response. We know this after a, just a few seconds of analysis. You know, it's not like we're stupid. We're immature. It's a whole different thing. The immaturity is that real holding to what appears and adhering to it, believing in it, and not questioning that historically <laughs> appearances have not been reality. Yeah. So, you know, you just kind of sit with when are the times I've been wrong? Because it gives you confidence that you actually do know what is correct. Yeah, if, you're nev if you've never been able to recognize your own mistakenness, then it's hard to have that kind of confidence that says, with more analysis and more habituation, I will train myself out of this ignorance. And I'll have that, that same sense that I have as an adult when I look in the mirror and I see a face in the mirror, I don't believe my face has split in two and my own face is now looking back at me. I'm an adult, I know it's a reflection, but it does still look like there's a face there. I just don't believe it. But before we were an adult and maybe when we were a very tiny baby, you know, maybe six months old, if we saw ourselves in the mirror, we were like, ooh, another baby. Yeah, or if we were a cat or something, we'd wanna have a fight. Yeah, so right now we're not at the level of saying, I can't have things appear this way. We're saying just because they appear this way, doesn't mean it's true. So that's, that's the place where we're living is that for a very long time, things will continue to appear incorrectly or deceptively. The fact that they appear that way doesn't mean we have to buy into it, but we have to train in not buying into it. Particularly in quiet moments alone when we're not too triggered. Once you're well-trained, you can do it even when you are triggered, yeah? But you know, if you find yourself with something very simple, like I am sure that this cookie will bring happiness and you're going for it and you're like, the happiness is coming closer and closer. Soon it will go in my face and the happiness will be achieved. If part of your mind says, not from its own side, yeah, or merely labeled by the mind, <laughs> right? Then you've kind of like started to interrupt the pattern. Yeah, if you can start to bring it in in those smaller moments, then when your coworkers are being confusing or when your partner is being disruptive or when your children are being naughty or whatever the case may be, you're not giving them the power to steal your peace. Yeah, you're saying just because it appears this way doesn't mean this is the whole story. Just because it feels this way doesn't mean my response is accurate or necessary or needs to stay as long as it traditionally has, right? But all of this relies on having enough humility and confidence to call yourself a lunatic child. Yeah, humility without confidence is no good because then you'll just crumple and think I'm just a stupid, hopeless case. You know, confidence with no humility is gonna turn into arrogance. But you have the confidence because you have Buddha nature. 
right? You have the potential for full and complete Buddhahood. So why would you look down on yourself? But you also know mistakes have been made, right? Mistakes have been made. And so that just kind of cools you down and gives you that confident humility that is ready to check. Is this appearance telling me the truth? Probably not the whole truth. Let's give it some space before jumping to react or let's manage our reactivity in a way that has more skillful means. Yeah. So, you know, these, these verses are really interesting because the language can be quite provocative, but that could be the very thing that invites a self-examination at a level that we haven't done yet. Because right now we're competent people, we're intelligent people, we function okay in the world. And so to identify in this way, it kind of challenges our pride a little bit. And we think, no, I'm not. I pay my taxes. I fill up my car with gas. I get the job done, you know, and it can be sort of like, mm. but if you can start to unpack it a little bit, um, it will lead to more development. Does anyone have any, any kind of thoughts about this idea of having humility and confidence of identifying as the lunatic child, not the lost cause, right? But how does that land when you think in, that, in those terms? Does it bring something useful? I yeah. think it's... I think it's extremely helpful because I think we talk a lot about how humility is important, but we you're so right. It makes so much sense that we also need to have the confidence so that we don't crumble. And yeah, thank you for saying that. Yeah, Buddha nature is a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. Yeah, Andrea, did you want to add? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it also reminds us to have a little bit of a sense of humor about ourselves to not take ourselves too seriously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm glad that you brought up sense of humor because I think that's a good sign of if we've started really believing in the appearances of ignorance, we lose our sense of humor. That's like one of the first signs that we've really started to reinforce that habitual grasping is if we've lost our sense of humor. If someone says, are you sure that's as true as you're saying, and we get really defensive, you know, then we've really kind of gone down the wrong road. And if someone, you know, challenges us on something that would have once made us defensive, and we just laugh and say, oh my gosh, you're so right, I'm so sorry. You're not crumpling into humiliation, you're laughing at the absurdity of humans. You know, and you're connected to humans. You're not feeling like you're the rare one who doesn't have their act together. You're joined together in the great absurdity of humanity. You know, and you think, oh, aren't we not? We're just rid ridiculous is what we are, but we won't always be anyway. You know, it, you know, a lightness can happen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that way we can keep going. Yeah. Without getting too sidetracked. I think you were saying that. Exactly. And, you know, the problem with self-awareness in the spiritual path is that we're not used to having self-awareness with a kind gaze. You know, who, what, when you're looking at what you're saying to yourself, when you're looking at your mind, it needs to be with a kind gaze that says, of course, I think that way. Not much has challenged my thinking up until now. So if it's the wrong way of thinking, I'm not bad. I just need more education and habituation. There's nothing wrong with me, right? But when your self-awareness doesn't have a kind gaze, you become really fragile and really vulnerable to criticism and really um, you know, easily grumpy or easily depressed, depending on your particular afflicted modality. Whether you're more of an attachment person or an anger person, you implode or explode, right? But if you're not over-identifying with your mistakes, there's a lot more freedom to say, and now we shift, and now we shift. I really think that looking at the afflictions should be the way in which we look for skin cancer, right? Like you're looking for skin cancer, looking for skin cancer, right? I have curse you Swedish ancestors. I'm always looking for skin cancer. And if you find a dodgy freckle, right? If you find a problematic mole and you go to the doctor, you don't think you're a bad person. You think 
there's some conditioning which made my skin vulnerable. Let's cut it out. And then you don't think, oh, my precious skin cancer, don't take it out. This is part of me. That would be ridiculous, right? You're like, freeze it, get it off, get it off. It's cancer, please get it off. You know, even though it came from cells in your body, you know them to be problematic cells. You know them to be really something you want to get rid of. And when we see our own pride or jealousy or anger, we want to look at it like skin cancer of, thank goodness I found you. I found you, that means I can start cutting you out. But if you're overly identified, you think, no, no, that's part of me, that's part of my personality, that's intrinsic to my being, and it feels like a self-attack. So self-awareness needs a kind gaze, and it needs lack of identification with whatever it is you find, whether it's good or bad. Yeah, because everything dependently arose. Okay, so more. So child, we are a child, not just crazy because we behave immaturely because we misunderstand reality. So then verse three says, she is perhaps that is and is not quietly spoken by my brother dependent arising. This diverse subject object world is my mother's gentle smile this cycle of birth and death, her deceptive words. So there's a lot in this verse, and I'm really curious to hear what Jado Rinpoche says, but my brother is an analogy for dependent arising, but some commentaries say my father is also an analogy for dependent arising. So it really depends on the commentator. But when we say dependent arising, what we're talking about are the reasons why things are empty. They're empty because they depend. Things are empty because they depend. That's something that we want so clear in our mind. What do they depend on? Well, for impermanent things, they depend on causes and conditions. For all phenomena, permanent or impermanent, they depend upon parts and whole, as well as on context, right? This is only a big room in comparison to the room next to it, which is small. But in comparison to, I don't know, a big hall in a theater, this is a small room. So it depends upon context, right? And then most subtle is being merely designated on a valid basis or being merely labeled by the mind. So because things are dependent, they're empty. They're empty because they depend. And this is sometimes called the king of reasons, um, clarified by people like Lama Tsongkhapa. Okay. So going back to those three, um, just having a look, I think this is familiar to some of you. Did you want to ask a little bit about dependent arising? So when I say causes and conditions, every, you know, all impermanent things are dependent on causes and conditions, what immediately comes to mind? Like what's a cause, what's a condition? Even in the most ordinary of examples. If I guess you was here, you would use a table, wouldn't he? Or a flower? Yes, and he would say the substantial cause of the table is what? And it's not a trick question. Wood, exactly, wood, just wood. And you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> right? right? The substantial cause is wood and then the conditions are what? What help the wood be a table? Right, the tree, the carpenter, the screws, the assembly, etc. right? Those are the conditions. And the same is th true of anything that's produced. Yeah, there's a substantial cause, which is the main thing. And then there are the coactive conditions. So this kind of points us to a karma conversation. And that's, you know, a story for another day. But if we're thinking that all impermanent things depend upon causes and conditions, First of all, impermanent things are the things we have to deal with on an everyday basis. There are permanent things, you know, like uncompounded space, right? But they're not causing trouble in our daily life. So we don't really worry about the permanent things. We're really looking at impermanent things, those things that change moment to moment to moment. And that includes our mind, changes moment to moment to moment. 
so the problem is, is that we mistake causes for conditions all the time. And that's part of our lunacy. And that's part of our immaturity as the lunatic child that needs to recognize their mother, right? So for example, if you're feeling happy right now, it, it is about the series of seeds that were watered prior to this moment, yeah? So the condition is this moment and all the things in this moment, you know, the words, the people around you, the chair you're sitting on, the temperature, all sorts of conditions watered the seed for your current experience. But your current experience started getting watered moments before and the seed was planted who knows how long ago. Yesterday, 20 lifetimes ago, you know, the seed was created by moments of positive action if you're feeling happy or moments of negative action if you're feeling unhappy or neutral karma if you're feeling neutral. But the problem is, is that we take everything at face value and you think 100% of the reason I feel this way is 100% about the things in front of me in this second. And very rarely do we even consider it might have something to do with our own mind and our own mental state. That's a good day, right? But it's not even just about what's happening with our mind and our mental state in this moment. That's a powerful condition, but it's not the only one. So looking at causes and conditions kind of frees up what is really happening here. It opens the story. You know, we kind of have this internal narrative in our head, whether it's in words or just in impressions of here's what's happening right now. If you're remembering causes and conditions, the story is a lot more broad. There's a lot more possibilities. There's a lot more nuance, which means things like blame start to lose power. Things like, I don't know, admiration start to be less concrete. Hopes and fears lose their agitated quality and contentment is a lot more accessible. Thoughts? Causes and conditions, it's, it's a basic conversation, but it's actually not a basic practice to start thinking about them. And, you know, we have to keep remembering dependent arising is a lot more understandable and a lot more accessible than things being empty of inherent existence. So your entryway into emptiness is to really understand dependent arising very, very well, which means use your daily life as an example. So then parts, right? Parts are easy, parts and whole. So for something to have parts, you need a concept of a whole. To for something to be a whole, it needs to have parts. They're mutually dependent from the Prasangika view. So, you know, that's interesting. That's maybe not as relevant in your everyday emotional drama life, but it can be, it can be. Because again, you can start to think, what are the qualities or the pieces or the parts I've decided makes a whole good person, <laughs> right? How, like how many qualities do there need to be before I give them the stamp, good person, safe, reliable? And as soon as you do that, it kind of bounces back and you believe it. Yeah, if you are smiling at me, if you are friendly to me, if you use respectful words and behaviors, if you follow through on your promises, then you are a good person, I give you this stamp, and now when I see you, I am happy to see you. As if that's the whole story. Yeah, so you're looking at causes and conditions and parts, realizing you decided the criteria. And because you decided the criteria, that feeds back and is kind of self-reinforcing. If you decided someone's a bad person, now you're grumpy to see them, and it doesn't feel like you made yourself grumpy by how you labeled them. It feels like they made you grumpy because they're inherently bad. Yeah, you're like, but look at the criteria. Look, they fulfill all the criteria of bad, difficult person. Yeah, look, <laughs> right? And then you remember, all right, well, if I just saw someone across the street that looked like that person, that difficult person in my life, and I was sure it was them, I would ruin my own peace just as badly if it were actually them. Yeah, you'd be like, oh God, that person again. Oh no, not that person. And then you realize it's not them and you're sort of embarrassed. Like, oh, I just ruined my day and it wasn't even them. Yeah, 
So if the person actually gave you the feeling, only they could be the one that gave it to you. But because you put that branding on them, now it's bouncing back, even when it's not even the, that same person. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question from the Gompa. Go ahead. Oh, I just have a question. Okay, so what if somebody does something that is harmful to you? And because you were harmed by that person, you labeled them as a bad person. Mm -hmm. Is that but, but now they're really not a bad person, even though they harmed you? Well, this is the question, right? She's asking if someone harms you and you label them as harmful, maybe out of reasons of safety or precautions, does, does this whole conversation mean somehow they're not a bad person because they hurt you? You know, and it's, it, it kind of boils down to some, some kind of general psychology conversation of are people their behaviors? Yeah, and is one behavior the shining example of the whole of a whole person? You know, and this is where we get into these like equanimity conversations of the person you dislike the most in the world, there is another person in this world who adores them, right? Who thinks that they are just the best thing since sliced bread, who is so happy to see them, even if it's only their mother, right? But like somebody likes them, right? And before they did anything to you, you had no emotional response towards them particularly unless you had super strong karma with them or they reminded you of someone, right? So none of this is to say you can't label things as harmful. Relative truth exists, ethics exist. Yeah, the ethics of refraining from the 10 non-virtues exist, but they exist in a relative sense. Yeah, to say something is harmful is contextual. Right, because take for example, someone uh, slaps you and you think, oh, that's an easy example of 100% harmful. But is it harmful in every single context? What if you were on, in a theater company and on stage and someone was going to do a stage slap and they didn't do it very well and they actually made some contact, you're not gonna be mad at them. You're probably gonna laugh and say, oh God, that's embarrassing. You actually slapped me instead of a stage slap. You're not gonna think, oh, curse you. So if it was just that motion, which was the harm giving emotion giver, it would always be the case. And you know, it only exists because you're inferring this person meant to harm me, therefore I feel harmed. Yeah, and many other stories as well. So this is why understanding emptiness and dependent arising or, in, or understanding ultimate truth and relative truth is like a razor's edge. Because if you go too far and go into like nihilism, you start thinking nothing is really anything. Yeah, or anything can be anything. Either nothing matters or everything matters inherently. You go into this extreme, but if you're sitting with ethics are ethics 100% divorced from context, just as they seem, then you become a fundamentalist, right? So like take something positive, take something like giving food to someone who's poor and you say that's 100% good giving food to the poor 100% good 100% yeah and you feel quite I'm a good person now yeah is it true that giving food to poor people is always in all contexts 100% the right thing to do or in some contexts is it better to teach them to access resources where they can feed themselves or to help them link up to places where there are more resources or to help them um, get a different skill set so they can make their own money or blah 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 is there a context when giving food to someone who's poor might be enabling there might be a context for that right but if you're holding on to thinking this action is inherently good always in all contexts you're missing the whole story and it's very easy to then think i am good yeah and that identity that ego trap is just ripe for trouble because what if then the poor person you give food to looks at the food and says well i don't like this and they throw it at you <laughs> right then you're so mad at them how dare you not appreciate my kindness yeah, et cetera, et cetera, right? So context is king. Yeah, this is the thing. It's like, it's all about context. And how do you get to a framework where you see all of the edges and all of the story? And that's the very conversation we're talking about is that context is nearly infinite. It's infinite, which isn't to say it's not there. 
just like parts are infinite, which isn't to say there aren't parts. You know, so you can say this cup has parts, it has a handle and a bottom and sides, and you think you've gotten to the end of the story of the parts. And then someone says, what about the paint and the porcelain? You say, oh yeah, more parts. What about on the atomic level, all the different atoms? Oh, now I've gotten to the end of the story of the parts. Oh, what about the electrons and the neutrons and the quarks? Oh, now I've gotten to the end of the story of the parts. And then you go further and further and further until you get to what you seem, seem to think is the most fundamental building block particle and realize even that has a left side and a right side and a top and a bottom, if such a thing were to exist, etc. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have parts, right? Just because you can't get to the end of the list. Context still exists even if you can't get the whole story in one ordinary person's mind. But even just widening the radius just a little bit can start to soften your knee-jerk emotional response. Yeah, just giving yourself a slightly bigger story of them, a slightly bigger story of you, a slightly bigger story of this, frees up more space for choice, frees up more space for what does this all mean? And what if I just decided it means? You know what I mean? <laughs> Ish. You with me or you have a, a qualm, you have a, a doubt? Processing. Yeah, processing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Zoomers, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very yeah. helpful. That's very helpful to, to hear. And just processing, yeah, taking yeah, that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this is not even getting to the most subtle, is it, that all phenomena are merely labeled by the mind on a valid basis? <laughs> yeah, Joanne's saying it hurts the head a little bit, indeed, right? It's a lot. Um, you know, my shortcut, and those of you that know me already know my shortcut, but my shortcut is to say a backstory will ruin all villains, <laughs> right? A backstory will ruin all villains, so, you know. I always remember Star Wars because everyone loves Star Wars, especially Buddhists. And then those horrible prequels came out that were really not solid plot wise, but gave you some context for why Darth Vader is the way he is. And then now you're like, oh, poor Darth Vader. Oh, man. You know, he still shouldn't do all that mess with the Death Star, but I get it. <laughs> right. You know, make it simple for yourself and realize as soon as you know someone's history, you soften. They make sense to you. And it's not the same thing as excusing bad behavior, but that bad behavior no longer steals your peace. And that's what we're really trying to work towards is for other people's bad behavior to not steal our peace. And if we can see that their bad behavior came from suffering and came from ignorance, then our mission is how do we eliminate suffering and ignorance instead of how do we squash bad people as if things were that simple and they just aren't. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What if they're not in a position to know their backstory? Because I think everybody out there and in here gets really upset when somebody cuts them off in traffic, and that will ruin your day. Yeah. And you don't know this person's backstory at all or even can fathom it. Yeah. So what do you do in that situation? Yeah, yeah, she's given the someone cuts you off in traffic um, example. <laughs> you don't know their backstory. You can think, oh, they have a pregnant lady in the back like a movie and they're rushing to the emergency room or maybe they're just a jerk, right? They might just be a jerk and just a terrible driver, but that's not to say there's not suffering there. So you don't have to know the backstory. You know that there is one, right? You're practicing and remembering there is always context. And then eventually you don't need to know the details anymore. But I think it helps sometimes to practice in learning the details of badly behaved people. You know, watch a good documentary on a serial killer, right? It'll sort of settle you a little bit. Doesn't mean you still want them to do it, but now you kind of get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jana, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking about like context, if they were, if they, you know, are a jerk to think like, well, yeah, there is suffering there and to think like of that even bigger context and they're stuck in the same place that we are with ignorance and afflictions and confusion and and misguided attempts at getting happiness and it really is probably a really hard life for them too, you know. 
yeah. yeah. And it's, it's hard to remind yourself to do it in the heat of the moment, which is why like in quiet moments by yourself, you bring that kind self-awareness that asks, when have I been the one that cut someone off in traffic, even if it was just when I was 16 and learning or 16 and more of a jerk, you know, but you're like, you're trying to find yourself in problematic behavior, not as a way of self-punishing, not as a way of putting yourself down, but as a way of relating to the human condition and realizing that if you knew more, you would have done better. That most of our mistakes are born from distraction not plotting to hurt. In those rare cases where we did plot to hurt someone, perhaps that has happened in our life. Why were we plotting? Yeah, there was all sorts of confusion and ignorance and suffering that really thought this person I want to harm is harming me or is a threat to me or a threat to my power or a threat to the people I love. Yeah, but most of the time we hurt people out of just carelessness. We don't even mean to. You know, and so then when people hurt us, can we have a moment's pause that wonders, did they even mean to? You know, I still am worthy of love, respect, affection, validation, all the things, but the fact that they did not give that to me doesn't mean they meant to wound. If they actually meant to wound, how far gone must they be? How far gone down the trail of suffering and ignorance must they be to actually want to hurt someone? And isn't that one of the most poignant things we can come across, right? So it's this dance of having assertiveness that doesn't allow people to take you for granted and hurt you. And you know, for communities, you don't want toxic cultures to evolve that are kind of ignoring bad behavior, but at the same time, not identifying the person as that behavior. Where do you put identification? You put it on their mother. Yeah, recognizing their mother, their emptiness of inherent existence, which means Buddhahood is possible. Their Buddhahood is possible, your Buddhahood is possible. If you recognize your mother, you can then become Buddha. Yeah, gradually see the fine print, but it's available to us all. So, you know, it's that line of what do I say internally to maintain spaciousness and clarity and creativity and non-reactiveness. Externally, what do I say to try and prevent things that we all agree on to be relative forms of harm, while at the same time realizing it's all based in context. You know, this is why things like traveling are so useful and why it's, you know, kind of sad that we can't travel as much right now, but traveling reminds you of how things exist in a context. You know, there was a few years of my life where I was in New Zealand half the year and then Israel half the year. And those are different cultures, as it turns out, even though they speak English. And the lovely Kiwis in New Zealand, who I love very much, are a soft-spoken, quiet group that have a lot of English influence and are less prone to communicating what they actually feel. So if they're having a bad day or a good day, it's hard to know because there's a lot of silence. In Israel, if you don't know what people are feeling, you're not listening. <laughs> Right, they're, they're gonna tell you whether you wanna hear it or not. And so you kind of ask yourself like, it's all communication and it's all coming from a societal context that makes perfect sense historically. If I don't remember that, I can think this is a good way, this is a bad way, or Americans are the middle way or some like ridiculous hubris or something. But if I'm remembering the historical context of communication, I don't have to know all the details. I don't have to be a grand historian, but I can think they make sense. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. I'll just try and synchronize to who's in front of me the best I can while knowing it can't be perfect because I didn't grow up the same way. You know, but if I forget that, I could get, you know, why don't you guys talk more? Why don't you guys talk less? <laughs> you know, grr, right? It can really help. So, you know, yeah, I guess just, just sitting with that, the brother, and um, this being merely labeled, merely designated on a valid basis, this warrants a bit more space. Um, so we'll come back to that. But uh, it's right about seven o'clock. So we'll have like a five minute break. Is that enough for you guys to have a leg stretch and go to the loo if you need to? Five minutes? Okay. See you in five minutes.
Okay, come on back. If you don't mind putting your um, videos on so I can have a look at you. Close that door. Or close that All right, if you guys aren't uh, aren't feeling comfortable having your video on, if you could send me a little thumbs up emoji so I can see if you're back. <laughs> okay, it looks like all my people are back. So we'll um, just revive Refuge in Bodhicitta briefly. <clears throat> Do in English this time. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go through a couple more verses and then we'll do a meditation. So uh, when we do the meditation, it'll be a little bit advanced. I think some of you have been to a lot of teachings and it'll be no problem. And those of you that are newer, just kind of make a mental note of spots where you might get lost and uh, we can revisit those. But uh, before we go into the way in which things are dependent upon um, designation on a valid basis. Do you have questions? Or kind of thoughts you might have heard from your other teachers that you feel warrant repetition? So far so good. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we're looking at my brother, dependent arising. And when we look at being merely designated on a valid basis, mere designation comes from the mind. And this subtlest level of dependent arising being merely labeled by the mind, it's, it's not a short conversation, right? It's a conversation that'll keep coming up again and again. But when we look at being merely labeled by the mind, what we're realizing is that things don't have a self existence. Yeah, they don't have a self existence. And I really like the way Lama Zopa Rinpoche explains um, being merely designated on a valid basis when he talks about something simple like the letter A. I think that this example really helps us understand. So when you were a little kid, before you understood the letter A, it's not like you couldn't see it, right? You could see the lines. You saw an up line and a down line and a cross line or however you draw it. The lines existed, but they didn't mean A to you. You had to be introduced, yeah? So there was a basis, yeah? Those black lines on a page, they were the basis for A, but you needed an introduction. Your mother or your father or your teacher said, when you see lines like that, it means A. And you had to have that reinforced again and again. A is for apple, A is for anchovies, A is for this, A is for that. It has this sound, it looks this way. It has this sound, it looks this way. And it happened so many times that we believed it, <laughs> right? And when we believed it, now we've believed it for so long that A jumps off the page at us. Those lines tell us that they are A. That is not what's happening, but that's the way it feels. You know, when you look down, it's like those lines say, I am an A, when in fact, your mind is saying that is an A on that basis there of those lines. 
you are telling it it's an A, but it feels like the other way around. Yeah, so there had to be the lines there, right? There had to be a basis, and the basis had to be in alignment with worldly convention. But that was not enough. You also needed a mind to label it. And then the reinforcing of that creates the type of belief that then bounces. Yeah. And so when you say all things are dependent because they are merely labeled by the mind on a valid basis, this is moving towards what we're talking about. And I think that this can really help shape our daily life in a different way. If we can have a, a shortcut that says merely labeled by the mind, whenever we feel certain of an opinion that might be problematic. Whenever we hear ourselves say, how wonderful or how dare they? This is just as it should be. This is not as it should be. Some big definitive concrete capital letter statement in our mind. If we can add merely labeled by the mind, what does that do? You know, even immediately to your reactivity. If you think, oh, this lunch is so beautiful and amazing, which is what I think when I'm here at Land of Medicine Buddha, this lunch is so beautiful and amazing. On the basis of those words, attachment can arise very easily. So then what if there's a bad lunch day? I'm all disappointed and I'm annoyed. And, oh, you know, it creates a whole expectation. It creates a whole story and it creates an attachment. If I think this lunch is so wonderful and amazing, merely labeled by the mind, I still get to enjoy it. I haven't ruined my enjoyment of it, but I have softened the edges of the ingredients for attachment. Yeah, I've kind of recognized that what I like and what I don't like are conditioned responses. How I respond to liking or not liking are conditioned responses. Yeah, so I'm kind of giving myself the power back from sensory experiences. Yeah, and so then I realize, okay, I like this because it reminds me of that, where I have an association of this, and I can remember, you know, strange facts that I know, like Tibetans, when they come straight from Tibet to India, don't necessarily like chocolate. And you think, how can that be? What do you mean they don't like chocolate? Chocolate is inherently delicious, right? But often, you know, newly immigrated Tibetans are like, meh. But they think that rancid butter is delicious. You need to let it get rancid in order to have a good taste, right? And that feels true to especially nomadic Tibetans. Yeah, and you think, well, that is not true for me. <laughs> Rancid butter is not delicious to me. It scares me because I think it's off because it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, you just kind of use kind of fun facts that you know, it doesn't need to be anything specific, but you're realizing that part of your experience is related to your label. But you're holding enough awareness of relative truth that doesn't go to this kind of neurotic place or overly idealized place that says I can label anything as anything because that's going too far. Yeah. So to say merely labeled by the mind isn't saying I can label anything to be anything because labeling itself is related to relative truth and relative truth still is related to convention, worldly convention. So if other valid consciousnesses would disagree with you, then you're not labeling correctly from a relative perspective. So relative truth and ultimate truth are attributed to the same object at the same time. They're just two ways of understanding one object. The ultimate truth of something is its emptiness of inherent existence. Its relative truth is deceptive. All relative truths are deceptive, but that's not the same thing as being completely wrong because they're not necessarily wrong conventionally. So then what is the deception? The deception is that they appear inherently existent when they are empty of inherent existence. And to say appear doesn't mean just see, you know, what you see to be the case. Appear means the kind of like the flavor of things, your impression of things is that they exist all by themselves from their own side. That's our immediate knee jerk impression of things. Is it just self arose just as it is in this moment? That's the impression. And that's an illusion. That's not true. Yeah. 
So the subtlest level of dependent arising, understanding that everything relies upon being nearly designated on a valid basis, is going to take some thought, right? It's going to take some mulling over for it really to strike a chord that changes the way we observe things. But even if you can just add that little tagline to your most concrete thoughts, nearly labeled by the mind, it's going to help interrupt the patterns of good equals that I'm attached and need it, bad equals then I have aversion and I want to punish it or push it. If merely labeled by the mind exists, you can just like or dislike without it being a giant afflictive story that gets out of hand. You can just think, I like it merely labeled by the mind. I don't like it merely labeled by the mind. It's not having no opinions. It's landing on your opinions lightly. Yeah, until I have more information, this is what I'm thinking. Does it make sense? Enough. Yeah, go ahead, Jenna. Um, yeah, what you're saying is um, reminding me of experiences I've had, you know, applying these sorts of views and seeing how it is so helpful to kind of soften things and make space. Like even just like when you know, like you said, when you notice I'm thinking, oh, this is wonderful or this is horrible to like also to like remember um, these teachings and to apply them. But my, I'm wondering, I'm trying to like navigate when there is something that I like I can know, like I'm, <laughs> I'm not seeing something correctly because I have so many afflictive emotions there um like how to balance applying this antidote which mm -hmm. feels very helpful while also but when i'm like have so much emotions there like yeah. how do you, how do you work with that <laughs> like right. but, yeah but without like you know stuffing the emotions or like being like no <laughs> go away you're you're not realistic, you know, because they're there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and pretending your strong emotions are not there or remembering that what they're saying is not valid is not enough to like stop them, is it? You know, it can be if you're very well trained, but usually you're, you know, here's what I feel, here's what I'm saying to myself about what I feel. Okay, I must remember the Dharma. And then you're like, well, that's good, but I still feel ugh, <laughs> right? right? Or I still feel agitated, or I still feel unsettled, or I still feel anxious. And I think this is where like conversations with neuroscientists and biologists can be really useful to realize that a big emotion triggers physiological responses that just take a certain amount of time to get out of your system. So it's useful to have the Dharma talk in your head. If the Dharma talk isn't going to be co-opted by your negative emotions. Sometimes our negative emotions have such an analytical quality to them that by inviting analysis, we can escalate the negative emotion, particularly anger, right? So if you're like a little angry and then you have like a Dharma talk to yourself about patience and loving kindness, sometimes it's enough for you to go, oh, that's true, yep. And sometimes your anger is like, oh, you're analyzing, are you? Well, I'm going to give you more fuel about why you should be angry and historical reasons for your anger and everyone who's ever reminded you of this person you're angry at. And then you're even worse than before analysis. Yeah, this can happen, right? And so you want to ask yourself, is the level of negative emotion suitable for analysis for me as an individual? Or is it better to just ride the wave? and let it roll through my mental experience, let it roll through my physical experience, and just consciously try not to feed it so that it can die a natural death. And all negative emotions will die a natural death if you don't feed them. Like, think of your worst temper, your most boiling rage. You can't stay that angry for that long unless you're consciously feeding the fire. It runs out of gas and then you're just, you know, grumpy, <laughs> right? But then someone reminds you of what you were boiling mad about and your analysis co-ops it. And now you're boiling mad again, like you were an hour ago. Yeah, but to like stay boiling mad takes a lot of fuel. So if you mm -hmm. rob it of fuel, it'll just peter out. 
And that's what we're trying to train and doing on those times when it's the wrong time for analysis. We can't always process our way out of it. Sometimes we can only process after the storm has passed and revisit what the triggers were, revisit how we can kind of soothe differently the next time. But in the storm itself, it might not be the time to process. So you use, you know, simpler, more direct strategies. Yeah, sometimes breathing meditation is good. Sometimes it can trigger an anxiety attack. Know yourself, you know? If breathing meditation is not the thing, how about just watching the clouds roll by like weather? Think sky, not the clouds, sky, not the clouds, <laughs> right? Stuff like that, yeah. But so much of the Dharma is understanding this is a vast array of tools. Not all of them are necessarily meant for me as an individual. The reasons for them are meant for me as an individual, but the Buddha taught a lot of different strategies. I'll just pick the ones that really make sense to me. And maybe eventually I'll use them all, but if one is working, just keep using it. And I heard one, one Geshe, I think it was Geshe Sange Trinle said that when you have a really strong negative emotion, analysis is really useful afterwards or before, but not during, unless it's an analysis of emptiness. And sometimes an analysis of emptiness, even in the peak of a negative emotion, can pierce it. If you can visualize uh, the deity Manjushri with the sword of wisdom cutting through ignorance, sometimes meditating on the wisdom realizing emptiness, even in your worst moments, can cut it. But that means in quiet moments, you had to have thought about it enough for it to kick in. So that's an interesting experiment to play with yourself next time is to really, the next time you're in a real big affliction, say it's anger, you know antidotes to anger are love and patience, but you sort of put a pin in it and say, I'll come back to patience and love after I settle down. Right now I'm gonna meditate on emptiness and see what happens. The emptiness of myself is the one having been harmed, the emptiness of the person who harmed, the emptiness of the harmful activity by looking at the dependent arising of each of those three agent action object it can be really useful. Cause then you're like, oh, who was harmed? Who is harming? What is harm? All right, it happened and I need to address it, but really it's not nearly so concrete a story as my affliction told me to be. Yeah. Yeah, any other thoughts before we do another verse? Ready? Okay, so this is, you know, the beginning of a conversation. Ask your friendly local Geshe for details. Um, but verse seven, I thought we'd jump to because it's referencing another piece of these analogies that is really important. So we were talking about the brother as being dependent arising. Now we're talking about the father. So the verse says, not finding my father when sought is in fact finding my mother. My father is found in my mother's lap. How kind, how these kind parents save their child, I am told. That's how. So my father is an analogy for the object which we investigate, the basis on which emptiness is established, or the basis that we look at the dependent arising of, depending on which strategy is going to work for you. So it's the object that we investigate. And in analyzing the objects that dependently arise, we come to understand emptiness. So it's reminding us that the gateway to understanding emptiness is always dependent arising, but we need an object of dependent arising to look at specifically. And there it is right there in my mother's lap. So, so this is just kind of this interesting invitation of remember to have a referent Remember that when you're analyzing emptiness or if you're analyzing dependent arising, you need an object, a mental object to sit with, to bring that analysis to. Just kind of making it too abstract isn't going to be as effective. So my father in my mother's lap, it means that all diverse phenomena are also manifestations of this emptiness, which quote, stays here, is ever present because it dependently arises, these two are always together. There is nothing that is empty 
that is not dependently arisen. There is nothing that is dependently arisen that is not empty. They're always together. And so all these diverse phenomena, this means like pure objects, impure objects, agents, actions, everything is a manifestation of emptiness or like the play or the display of emptiness, this potentiality. So I'm just gonna look a little bit at His Holiness's commentary. And again, I really recommend if you have time to watch that video. Um, so His Holiness starts with and be, ends with Lama Zopa Rinpoche offering a mandala. And then His Holiness reminds us that the song of the view, the other part of the title, refers to the view of dependent arising. And there's two principles the philosophical view of dependent arising and conduct, ethical practice of non-harming others. And this has to do with world peace. So here the topic is on the philosophical view, but we're never forgetting that you have to have together with it this ethical conduct of non-harmfulness. So just because it's a conversation of ultimate truth is not an excuse to forget ethics, which I think goes without saying, but I like that His Holiness referenced that right in the beginning. And that the subject matter of this text is basically the same as the subject matter of the Four Noble Truths. And he references a couple of other verses from similar texts, and I think I'll talk about those tomorrow. So just FYI, some Chanjakirti coming up. But I think if we look at verse 9, then we'll move into our meditation. So verse 9 says, Nargajuna and, and Chandrakirti set their instructions upon the wind, and Manjushri Gaba conveyed these to us by bird. So I hope to see my ever-present old mother without the hardship of a prolonged search. So what, what he's saying here is that a lot of the hard philosophical work has already been done for us by these previous scholars, particularly Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and then Manjushri Garba is referring to Lama Tsongkhapa, one and the same. So it's saying that there's a lot of efficiency in meeting these teachings now because the hard work has been done. So then what do we do to actually realize emptiness? What's the steps? Yeah. And that's where we get verse 10. There seem to be among today's scholars some caught in a web of words, like thoroughly withstanding and true existence, who seek only to negate some creature with horns, while leaving intact this everyday appearance of solidity. So the author is pointing to a problem in the approach of some other scholars, which is to negate a non-existent, rather than to find the non-existent within the self. So a non-existent example that Tibetan Buddhists use are horns of the rabbit. This is a really classic example that um, there is no such thing as a rabbit with horns. Um, of course, being from Montana, I immediately think of jackalobes, which are a mythical creature of rabbits with horns. And there's all sorts of gift shops where you can buy one. But uh, this is the thing is that we can go too far and think that by negating something that isn't there, that we're coming to emptiness when in fact we have to look at what our belief in the non-existent is first. And so the process we're gonna do in this meditation is called the four keys or the fourfold analysis. And we'll just do the first part today. So this is familiar to some of you. Um, the first thing you do is recognize the object to be negated or refuted. You have to see what it is you think the self is and then see the way that that is actually impossible. But first you have to kind of capture it. Like what is your identity? What is your personality? What is that me feeling? That facade we project, that you know, identity we hold to, we have to recognize it first. And the way you do it, the way you find it is to provoke it into prominence. So through imagination or through memory, you provoke a sense of self by thinking of times when the self felt particularly vivid. Yeah, particularly vivid. So to find the object of negation, you have to think about when someone praised you or someone criticized you 
or accused you or when you were in like mortal danger or even just like you were about to fall down the stairs and you're like, you know, and you felt self (laughs) arise. Because when we're just sitting here quietly, the self is kind of quiet. You know, it doesn't feel like there's an aggressive identity that's like saying, I am inherently existent. I am inherently existent. It doesn't feel like that's what our self is doing. It feels like a gentle, quiet self until it's provoked. So you could imagine that someone that you love and respect pointed at you and said, you ruined everything. (laughs) And you go, me? The me is very solid. Or someone you love and respect said, you are the amazing and the source of all that is good. And your little cheeks turn red and you go, me? Ding. Yeah. But like the self is really arising strongly. Yeah. Can you kind of like feel the difference between like quiet sitting here listening to teachings as opposed to being actively celebrated or criticized? They feel so different, don't they? Like the self kind of rears up as if to say, I am. And that's the feeling that we're trying to capture in this meditation. So before we even do it, I just kind of wanted to explain that a little bit. This object of negation has to be found before you can find the (laughs) non-finding, right? So what we're working our way to is to see that it's not there at all. There are two selves. There's the one that does exist conventionally, merely labeled by the mind. There's the self that doesn't exist at all. That's the object of negation. Which one do we think we are? The one that doesn't exist at all, even nominally. It's like we've never even touched the conventional eye. We've never even gone that deeply to see mere convention. We really do believe that we are Maybe our way of speaking, our way of being, our gender, our age, our level of economic comfort, our education level, our whatever, you know, there are points of prominence in our personality that feel inherently I. Yeah. And whether they're a specific point of prominence, like, you know, your level of intelligence or your race or your gender or your religion or whatever, or it's kind of a more subtle I-ness feeling, we all have it, right? And so I think it's, it's interesting to explore when you've really felt the need to defend the I, because that very one that feels like it needs defending is the one that's not there at all. Now the body might need some defending from what, you know, this or that, various things, sure. But the self, what exactly? is it that you're defending? And so you're just kind of hunting for it. Yeah, who is that anyway? Yeah, have, have some of you folks had classes on the object of negation before? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, wave from the abyss. Do you have any um, fun ways of capturing that little trickster that um, other llamas have told you or you've come to yourself? Capturing the object of negation? Or questions too is fine. Yeah, Lynn, something? Oh, we got to unmute you. There you I, go. Hey. I when I have a memory of being criticized and thinking, what? You know, it's a combo of feeling that I'm sort of like, it's like peanut butter. Mm. It's like something smear it's called in some in yiddish it's called a schmear so it's sort of like a <laughs> yeah. schmear on top of a bagel you know what i mean yep so it feels that, <laughs> but but that's making it cute i think yeah. the feeling about it is like you know have some memory of some something where i go wow <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, being criticized is is a useful one. I, I often use being praised too, because like if you're praised and you have low self-esteem, then the praise lands like, no, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. If you really knew me, you would think I was crap. Yeah. And if you have really good self-esteem, the praise lands like, oh yes, yes, I am. Thanks for noticing. But like either way, it's really like flares to life when you get praised. 
you either are like humiliated and your eye is this little concrete slab in the center of your body, or it just kind of expands into light and shininess, but it's like, it's an eye. Yeah, it is an eye. Yeah, I, I feel, I sometimes feel embarrassed when I'm praised. Yeah, like, exactly. Like the know, cringe. I think true about that, but why do I, you know, whatever. Yeah, who is cringing? That's, that's, yeah, <laughs> who's the one that's cringing and like, no, 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 and that's so great. Yeah, it's like, there, found it. Object of negation, you little trickster. Yeah, yeah or you pretender. Um, I think sometimes if you're overestimated or underestimated, mm -hmm whatever your perception of estimated is, you know, however you see yourself to be, if someone thinks you're less than that or more than that, that can trigger the cringe. Um, you know, it, it, the cringe is a, good, is a good kind of like flavor of the object of negation. Um, yeah, or the feeling of needing defense. Yeah. Um, yeah, other times when it comes up, usually praise or criticism are enough to get you there. And if you can't think of a specific memory for this meditation, you can just use the general feeling of being praised or being criticized, sometimes can bring it up. Um, there was a question in the chat about, um, I can capture the object to be negated, but I don't believe that it's not there at all. Yeah, and it, that is really common. And in this process, you have to be so stealthy because if you capture the false eye and then you too aggressively analyze it, it'll say, no, no, I never said, I never said I was inherently existent. I just said I was nominally existent. No, no, that, that's what'll happen. It, it'll, it's like, it will pretend like it's not a problem, <laughs> right? So you have to be a spy. And this is in the traditional text. This isn't just like Yintonism. Like really you have to find the object of negation and then start to poke it very gently with analysis so that it dissolves rather than hides. Yeah, so it kind of goes poof into non-finding, which isn't nothingness, it's more like everythingness or potentiality-ness, but it's certainly absence of that self, absence. Yeah, and so the first step honestly is just to find the bugger and don't even challenge it. And then it's like, in my mind, you know, because I watch too many episodes of Law and Order, I always pre pretend like the object of negation is the perp in a cop show. And then I've got good cop analyzer and bad cop analyzer. And the good cop's like, you're so amazing. And then bad cop's like, you're so terrible. And the perp is like the object of negation. Yeah, and he's like, I don't know if I'm good or bad, but I'm feeling myself. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that spotlight kind of like, yeah. And then the good cop and the bad cop leave. And then the perp's there. And he starts to feel kind of safe, like, okay, they're gone. Yeah, and it's in that feeling of, okay, I've, here's the perpetrator of all the trouble. And now the analyzers have kind of faded. Now I'm gonna come back in even more gently like a friend and prod the seeming reality of it until it just kind of goes, nah, yeah. Whatever kind of mental imagery works for you, but um, this is what we're going to do. So if you want to get yourself into a posture that's useful for meditating, nice straight back. And just kind of, if you're on a chair, just make sure you're not crumpled forward or crumpled backward, that you're kind of sitting in a nice straight spine way. And before we even start, we're just going to spend maybe two minutes watching the breath, allowing the surface distractions to settle. So start by just relaxing the body and grounding yourself in the body. If there's any tension in your face or shoulders, just allowing that to release. And down through your torso and back, relaxing and releasing. Particularly the stomach 
very soft, not clenched. The back very strong, but not rigid. And relaxing all the way down through the legs and feet. And shift your focus to the breath. And just the breath, simple and direct. And whenever you feel distraction tempting, just gently acknowledge it and come back to the breath on purpose again and again.
And then with a strong bodhicitta motivation, using this analysis to develop into our fullest potential in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, we shift to the analytical mind. And we think, first of all, I must recognize the object to be negated or refuted, which means I need to find this seemingly inherently existent self. I intellectually know that the self does not inherently exist, but I also know that it very much feels like it does in strong peak moments during life. And so even though you know where this is going, you put a mental pause and say, first, let's just find it. And see if you can provoke that feeling of inherently existent self through imagination and memory of a time of praise, criticism, or danger. Try to get that I to arise strong sense of self. that one that feels wounded or misunderstood or disrespected and ignored, or that one that feels in control and powerful, just feel your way into feeling that strong self. Whether you like and celebrate your body, whether you hate and despise your body or are neutral about it, sometimes the body feels like the self, healthy or unwell, good or bad, just kind of search into that feeling. Sometimes the body is the self. Sometimes when we think of our body, we think of its age, like I am too old to be taken seriously or too young to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. 
And whether you feel that's completely right or totally unfair, there is sometimes an I at the center of that feeling. And then we look for that feeling of I within our view of our own intelligence. Sometimes the I feels like we are inherently something or someone where information and knowledge is quickly and easily processed. We are smart. Or maybe we identify as slow. It takes a long time for me to understand. Or maybe we think we're very ordinary, very average. But often the I can be found in our relationship to our own intelligence. Search for it there. Sometimes we identify as our level of likability. We think of ourselves as hard to understand, hard to get to know, hard to like and understand. Or very easy to like, easygoing, easy to be with, companionable and friendly. Sometimes that sense of self can be found there. how we imagine others see us. And so see if as that sense of self becomes clearer and more defined, don't challenge it yet. Don't scare it away. Say, sure, you're there, you personality, you body. You're self-created in some way. Your experience is added to you but there was some sort of core, sure. Don't scare away the impression of self. Let it feel safe there under the spotlight. Let it feel as true as it seems in moments of criticism or praise.
You can repeat in your head your own name or just the word me. This is me, this is me. And then very gently start to explore. Does that solid sense of self have any relationship to causes and conditions? You could start with something like your personality. Try and find one piece of your personality that does not depend on causes and conditions, that somehow was magically born out of nowhere, spontaneously and inherently you. I just am this way. And if you find it, then dissect it. Are there any causes and conditions that made it born? That little piece of me. You could take something like, I am a kind and patient person, and then ask yourself, did that come out of nowhere? Was it learned? Kind in what context, from whose perspective? What is kindness anyway? Only existing within a certain culture or framework, certain behaviors perceived as kind or otherwise. In one culture direct, in another culture blunt, and yet another culture rude, the same set of words. And we can go back to the body, my body, mine. And then think the substantial cause of this body has nothing to do with me. It was the sperm and the egg of my parents, two totally other people. There wasn't a third little body that invited those components to it. So this bag of bones that has been my home for so long didn't come from me, isn't me, still sort of feels like mine. So what are the conditions? The air and the water, the warmth and the food, all the things that keep it going since my parents' materials met. Also not me. Parts. 
components. Even my own name probably came from someone else. And so this might all feel very logical, but then if you think about your childhood compared to now, it might still sort of feel like there was a tiny version of you that simply grew up and learned things and gathered experience, but is still somehow the same core person. And then you can imagine looking at a photo album of yourself as a child, how small, how different. Look at other children of that age who exist now and think they don't have the behaviors of adults or opinions of adults. But that little five-year-old me still sort of feels like the me now, just a more mature version. So find that core. If it's there, it should be findable. Certainly there's a continuity of consciousness of one moment leading to the next, the past informing the present. But is there a core, an unchanging nugget that has always been me? See if you can arrive at finding the non-finding of that core self. And then think to yourself, the self that does exist is that which is merely labeled by the mind on the collection of aggregates, form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness. There is no I in addition to that or in charge of that, no unchanging component save for emptiness itself. And through, through the power of this analysis, 
May we swiftly cut the root of samsara, develop the mind to full enlightenment in order to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. Okay, so you can relax your attention. Do you have any um, impressions that you feel comfortable sharing or questions? Um, I, I yeah, go ahead. Share. Uh, I found it very helpful to search for that fixed eye through various means. That was very helpful. Uh, so thank you for the instruction. Um, it's going to be something that I have to work with going forward um, to keep practicing with, definitely. Um, but I, I did feel like I made a little bit of progress there looking at, um, you know, like the blame and then the praise. Mm. Um, that was very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it, it warrants repetition for sure, <laughs> for sure. This is kind of stage one, and we'll do the advanced version tomorrow. But, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, this is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. It's 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 interesting, and um, you know, it's. It's an internal conversation. It's a vital internal conversation for us as Buddhists. Why? Because ignorance is the root of samsara. We want to cut the root of samsara. How to do that? Realize the emptiness of inherently existent self and phenomena and etc. We have to kind of start with what's the lie? What's the pretense? What's the facade? Because if we jump straight to, yeah, 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 everything's empty of inherent existence, it doesn't have a visceral lived quality that really confronts the everyday problematic behaviors, you know, or the root of the problematic behaviors. So it's, it's really important to understand this object of negation, but it is a personal, private conversation. You know, it's not something we want to say to other people unless there are Dharma friends in the mood for that conversation. You know, if someone says, you know, I am... I don't know, inherently Swedish. <laughs> and you'll say, well, at what point did that area become Sweden? At what point did your ancestors blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, you are, sure, no problem. And that's a social construct and doesn't exist from its own side. So both things can be true, you know, but if you start playing with people's identity and they're not in the mood for it, it's like really rude, right? And just because things are an illusion doesn't mean that people don't just kind of naturally group folks into us and them, whatever us and them looks like. And then on the basis of that, create, you know, government policies and societal conventions and workplace dynamics and friendship weirdness and et cetera, et cetera, right? So to say, oh, all that's an illusion would be to spiritually bypass people that have a real lived experience of suffering. You know, or um, you can get competitive weirdness, right? Like if someone says, oh, look, I'm really unwell. And then someone else says, oh, well, you're unwell. Let me tell you about my sickness. And it becomes like competitive, like who's the sick one? Who's the one that gets to have that identity? They say, oh, you you're a trauma survivor. What's your trauma? Let me tell you about my trauma. I win. You know, <laughs> like any of these things can be points of identity. Yeah, or like who's the strong one, who's the weak one, who's the smart one, who's the stupid one, who's the competent one, who's the incompetent one, you know, who's the masculine one, who's the feminine one. All of these things are social constructs that only exist because of context. And yet, because we group each other in this way, and there is disharmony and harm because of these things, you know, look at racism, for example, we have to acknowledge that it exists on the relative. Yeah, so just because it's a really provocative and important inner conversation doesn't mean it's a fair conversation to ask other people to have unless they're ready for it. Because particularly if there has been systemic harm because of the way people merely label by the mind, 
we need to address that because compassion is a huge part of our path, right? So it's, it's this delicate dance of what you say internally doesn't have to be how you converse externally unless it's with people already in the conversation, if that makes sense, right? So I don't know about you guys, but you know how the kids are talking about all this like uh, gender stuff lately? Yeah, and it's really important to say your pronouns and to make it trans inclusive and friendly and stuff. And I'm all for it. But of course, as a Buddhist, I'm like, merely labeled by the mind, <laughs> right? They're like, she, her, merely labeled by the mind. But I am a woman with a woman's socialization and general you know, anatomy. And that's not to say that socialization and anatomy makes me a woman. But for me, it has, I can acknowledge that and move on. But if someone else has been discriminated against because they have been mis merely labeled, that's suffering that they're trying to communicate and we want to alleviate suffering. Do you know what I mean? Right, so it's this delicate dance of Buddhism is advanced work of identity deconstruction. So if people are clinging to some aspect of their identity, even though it's empty of inherent existence, we do this to each other all the time. And so let's look at the relative truths of things and create you know, systems that make it feel very safe and welcoming for people to be themselves, even though the self is empty. No? Yeah, go ahead, Jenna. Well, just that example of, of gender, um, you know, like we recognize Shakyamuni Buddha as he, male, so like that there's, like it's it's not that the conventional existence isn't there i mean it does there's a conventional existence to like recognize um because i wouldn't go i wouldn't refer to shakyamuni buddha as she because they identified as he when they were shakyamuni buddha yeah exactly but, and we're talking about yeah. recognizing my mother is emptiness have a gender no emptiness does not have a gender but we're giving it a gender in order to relate to an analogy because we're already dualistic people and it helps us to kind of go with the flow of how our dualistic mind is already operating it's like you need conventional mind and you need conceptual mind in order to get out of conception and convention mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like you can't just suddenly have a conventional mind turn into something that is understanding ultimate reality without a series of thoughts getting you there. You can't just say, realize emptiness, go, <laughs> you know, you have to work your way into it. And you can't just say, be non-conceptual, go, you know, it, there's a sequence of events that needs to happen to work your way into it. So, you know, it's like, merely labeled by the mind is such a useful phrase for us because it's still acknowledging that there is a convention that we're working with, otherwise we can't function, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you know, we like we, Mother Tara, right? Is she a mother? No, she's a nun, <laughs> right? Is she even a woman? Well, the ultimate Tara, no. But, you know, there's a green lady on a tanka, and we can say that's a female Buddha, but Buddhas are genderless and genderful and who cares? Why do Buddhas manifest in any kind of way that has form? So we can relate, right? It's, it's very useful to think of all of the Buddhas as like the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas being like the ocean. And then the waves are a form that you can draw a, a boundary around and kind of define as there's a shape, there's a color, the Buddhas kind of can take shape and color like a wave from water in order for us to relate and speak to something because the ocean is too vast to conceptualize, you know? So it's like, all right, the Buddhas will take this form or that form. Maybe it'll be a green lady. Maybe it'll be a cute cat, you know? Like <laughs> they're gonna manifest in whatever way that our relationship to it is gonna move us towards enlightenment. Yeah, but that's not to say that relatively Okay, Tara is a woman, a cat is a cat, right, etc. It's a delicate dance because you can go so easily the wrong way into thinking everything is everything and anything can be anything and kind of like oversimplify it and approach something that is nihilism or eternalism. So the middle way is so delicate, razor's edge. So it's like, you, you know, you'll tip off one way or the other, but if you know that the middle way is the aim, then it's easier to recalibrate, I guess. Yeah. 
So that exercise of going through the levels of dependent arising is only one strategy. The more advanced strategy we'll do tomorrow, but the quick way I think to unpack a drama is to use the three spheres of emptiness, meaning the agent, the action, and the object are all empty because they dependently arise. And you don't have to go through all three levels of dependent arising, just pick one, you know, pick one that's striking you. But if you're thinking, okay, um, you know, like your example, someone cut me off in traffic, therefore I'm grumpy today. You know, that's got all the material you need for a good analysis. Who was the one that was cut off from whom? Yeah, the one that was cut off is only contextual because from the per, you know, from the speedy person's side, they were the zoomer <laughs> and you were the one that was cut off. So it's only from your perspective that you were cut off and you were only cut off because you have a certain conception of what the road rules are, <laughs> right? And what's the appropriate use of them and when is urgency necessary and when isn't it and all those kind of things. You know, and then what is it to be inconvenienced and its relationship to your mood? <laughs> because I'm sure we've all had the, the experience of when you've had a huge tragedy or a huge celebratory experience, like a big peak life experience, little stuff like being cut off either way aggravates you or doesn't even phase you at all. Like the emphasis shifts, doesn't it? Like if you have something bigger on your mind, then the little things change significance just kind of naturally. But before the big event, it felt like they had self-existent significance. Like this was very important today, you know? And if like the only thing that happened the day was being cut off in traffic, that's significant. But if a million other things had happened that day that were really interesting to your mind, that shrinks in importance just naturally. So it's, it's kind of like there's this whole spectrum of things happening and then we draw a little frame around it and say, this is what was important. And then it says, I am important. And then we believe it and we believe it and we believe it and we believe it. And then that's all there is. Do you know what I mean? So we're the ones drawing the frame and it feels like what we see in the frame is all there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah other thoughts? Did you get stuck anywhere where like intellectually you knew better, but experientially you're like, no, but that is the self. Did you have any little points of stuckness? Yeah. yeah I had something, yeah, something like that. Maybe that's what that was, is like, I would see, identify that, uh, that self, the me, the object. And I'd like laugh. It was just like, oh my gosh, that's so, uh, but then immediately, then maybe it was the self that was like sad, like and afraid and like, oh, <laughs> for, you know, because it was being seen and being told that it was not real. So like just yeah. these like different parts that show up. Yeah, yeah, I hear you there. And, you know, it's been said many times by far more impressive teachers that you need a very healthy sense of self in order to break apart the self. You know, you, you, you need really strong mental health. You need to know what your big habit energies are. You know, you need to know the way in which you relate to other people and your kind of pitfalls and strengths. You need to kind of know your disposition towards learning and your approach to meditation and just kind of like how you approach life. You need to know yourself. Yeah. And to kind of like have some kindness about that thing that you know. You know, you know your personality to be this and this and this and this, and you know yourself to be that and that. And in kind of knowing and accepting the self, then you can break it apart and say, each one of those pieces dependently arose. So all the things I love about myself and cherish about myself are learned behaviors that were supported through countless causes and conditions and are only useful in a certain context, but they're there, yay. <laughs> All the things I hate about myself and think are ugly and unbearable and unlovable are learned behaviors that existed through countless experiences and causes and conditions. I make absolute sense given my history, just like everyone else. And none of them are the core of me. I don't need to identify with them. 
but they're here and I need to navigate with them and I need to find ways to heal and move forward. You know, so do you see the way you kind of like, you land and release and land and release. If you're just kind of in this release, like I don't even know who I am before I even started to investigate, it's like you're too far away from normal convention, you know? And it's like, you'd need to make friends with normal convention to be able to bring in ultimate analysis and it not make you truly insane or truly mentally unwell as opposed to the way in which we are all lunatic children and no problem you know so it's it's like it's advanced conversations even though you know we're people that have studied a regular amount you know of I don't know, public school or whatever maybe we are university educated we're relatively smart people you know it's not about intelligence it's about merit or mental momentum and good you know kind of the good karma we've created through deep introspection in previous lives in this life that can give us the foundation of safety to pick apart identity without going into chaos yeah because just as tara is not inherently existent but still has shape and color and gender and prominent aspects like being of action and protection we too have certain prominent aspects that we utilize in certain ways, even though they're empty, you know? Yeah, there's a Gompa question. Certain people that can't speak for others that can speak for myself come to here or to another type of religion searching for their sense of self. Yes, lots of people are coming to Dharma centers looking for their self. Where do you go from there if you? don't really have a good sense of self to start. I know this is an advanced topic, but yeah, yeah. If you I mean if you don't have a good sense of self, it's not like you um so the, the Gompa question was basically if you came to a Dharma center because you're searching and you're looking for the self, maybe the like Oprah Winfrey authentic self, you know, what do people call it? You know, like pop psychology, like true self, whatever, or like Maslow's hierarchy, self-actualized self or whatever, right? That kind of stuff. If you're seeking that kind of self, and then you come to a Dharma center and you realize we're saying there is no inherently existent self, what do you do with that information? Is that a good summary of your question? You're saying you have to have a strong sense of self yeah. in, other, in order to deconstruct yourself. Yes, yes. To, to become a higher self, for yep. a better term. So if you don't really know who you are right now, but you want to so that you can start to deconstruct. Yeah. So how, where do you go? <laughs> so, yeah. So how do you find that strong enough sense of self that you can pick it apart without chaos? And honestly, I think it's, it's an inner conversation where if you're feeling that the analysis is creating a wobble with reality that is making it impossible to function, if it's triggering a kind of paralysis, maybe take a step back and focus more on compassion, loving kindness, patience, the more intellectually easy, the more experientially accessible parts of Buddhism. And you start to look at how the relative self responds to that kind of information. You know, how does it cope with moments where patience is appropriate, but anger is the habit. And if you're bringing that really strong self-awareness well, in the background, part of you knows, I think they're going to tell me that this self doesn't inherently exist, but I'm not really sure what that means yet, but I know it's coming. Then when you see that, like, oh, I do get really angry when this, this, and this happens, then that self-awareness doesn't make you cringe into, oh, I'm a bad person now that I've finally seen myself. I see how rotten I am to the core. It doesn't go down that spiral. You go, oh, wow, I do have a habit of anger, not I am angry. But I have a habit of anger in this in this context. That's a deep and important self-knowing, you know. But you're remembering maybe dependent arising that says, and my mother was just the same, <laughs> you know, or this and this trauma happened and reinforced that habit, or et cetera, et cetera. You know, so you're not overly identifying with what you see. Yeah, it's just that practice of seeing and going, yep, that's there. I accept. Yep, that's there. I accept. Did, did any of you guys watch Mr. Rogers when you were little? I'm dating myself, right? But um, Mr. Rogers used to have the most profound thing. And I know he can be cheesy in American, like 
put a pin in it, but you know, I am a, I'm a closet devotee of Mr. Rogers. And he would say, I love you just the way you are, just by being yourself. And the profound psychology of that is when you're 100% accepted and loved just as you are, then you can change. If someone's saying to you, you have to change, I will not accept you until you change, you almost like solidify and concretize your personality and say, no, I'm going to be like this forever. Pump. Right? So, I mean, the profound psychology of Mr. Rogers, who was, of course, a spiritual practitioner himself, he was a minister, is you have to just love flood yourself. You have to just flood yourself with acceptance and compassion and say, all of this mess makes sense. All of it makes sense. And all of these qualities show me what is possible and I can grow on them. You know, just like total love flood. And I actually am worthy and deserving of love, even if I never change, even if I never realize the object of negation, I am 100% worthy of love and compassion, just as I am. Then you can change. Yeah, then you can change. But you have to, you know, it's an inner conversation and it can be a cringy one depending on how we were brought up, right? Like maybe Americans, it comes more easily. But, you know, when I'm in Australia and New Zealand, they're kind of like, oh my God, you're so American. Please stop. No, that's horrible. Yuck. Yeah. And or depending on generation or gender, it's like, what do you mean love bomb yourself? That is the most new age woo woo nonsense I ever heard. You know, like allow yourself to feel that and then look at the logic of it. Yeah. It's not about a sugar coating, self-soothing to make your ego happy. It's about a true recognition that you are a mess because you have innate ignorance, just like everybody else. So don't be so hard on yourself for goodness sake. We all have innate ignorance and we have Buddha nature. So not to worry, you can train out of it. You know? Yeah, so it's gently, gently, right? Gently, gently. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Gampa. Have you ever seen a happy ego? Have I ever seen a happy ego? I've seen an excited ego, but then it's like a sugar rush and it crashes. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> a happy well, ego. Ego, you can't live with it and you can't live without it. You can't live with it. You can't live without it. <laughs> so far. This context. Without context, no word or no action have any meaning. Yeah. But if you would apply that, no system would ever work. Yeah. Including that famous search engine, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's and you know, the culture is a labeling and a yep. mechanism and, you know, they call it education. <laughs> I would yep. call it miseducation. Yes, we, we have all been miseducated. I, sure. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I thought we would just end with um, kind of a blessing invitation, sort of a meditation. So it'll be visualization. You can look at the screen if that helps you visualize. But if you'd rather just close your eyes, we'll do just a, a short visualization. This one is from Geshe Lama Konchok. And it's a way to kind of like clear the cobwebs a bit so that it's easier for us to realize emptiness going forward. So it's just a nice little shorty, just a couple minutes. So back into meditation posture, and then we'll do a little short visualization. So just resettle for a sec. And just remembering your motivation once again, in order to benefit all sentient beings, all sentient beings, all sentient beings. And now visualize in the space in front of you, Shakyamuni Buddha, or if you prefer, simple golden light and connect with him as the embodiment and representative of your own outer and inner spiritual refuge.
And then visualize Prajna Paramita, the Buddha of wisdom at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. Or if you prefer simple golden light that's slightly lighter in color and connect with her as the embodiment and representative of our own outer and inner developing wisdom. And then at her heart, visualize the syllable ah. And surrounding this is the Heart Sutra mantra, Taya ta om gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha. Or just imagine that you hear those syllables ringing in space. And then we're going to add reciting the mantra to the visualization. Think that infinite light emanates. And as that light emanates, as we recite the mantra, think oneself and all other sentient beings gain a realization of emptiness. And you can just have the visualization as simple light as you, if you prefer, but adding the mantra. I got a got a got a par I got a par a some got a body so ha I got a got a got a Paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate. Bodhisoha Tayata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Tayata Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhi So And the mantra Prajna Paramita. Shakyamuni Buddha, all dissolve into light and absorb into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. 
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Getso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You can relax your attention. Okay, thanks everyone. And we'll meet again tomorrow at the same time for part two. And um, I appreciate you coming, even though you are expecting Jada Rinpoche. Hopefully Jada Rinpoche will come soon. And uh, thanks very much to LMB for hosting. Thank you, Venerable. Really appreciate tonight. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. What a treat. Oh, great. Go ahead and leave all the wishes.